Katie was born in Washington. She had a difficult birth and that led to cerebral palsy. We spent about two years in the Vancouver, Portland area where she got care at Dornbecker. And then we moved to Elko, Nevada um, when she was about two to be closer to family and then started coming to primary and Ronald McDonald House then. She has lots of specialists and has had lots of specialists throughout her life. In the beginning, we had private insurance, which seems great, but there's big co-pays and um, things that aren't covered and caps on physical therapy and occupational therapy and speech therapy. Um, so that was our first barrier. We lived really close to the hospital, so that was nice. But then when we moved to rural Nevada, there is almost no care where we live. There are a handful of pediatricians, but once we moved, she was on Medicaid and they almost no one took Medicaid. Um, so we were here a lot. Uh, we do have a very small hospital, but it is not equipped to deal with um, kids, but definitely not kids like my kid. So if we go there, it's a serious emergency and I bring have to bring everything. So I have to bring her feeding tube extensions, her syringes, her meds, her, um, I blend for her, so her food. I even have to bring a nasal cannula because I don't have one to fit her. So if we go to that hospital, it's an emergency and we need to be flown out. <laughs> so we're four hours away and it's a really long way. So that's a huge barrier for us. Kate is super high needs, so we have to seek out specialists. We have to find the best fit for us. And even when we do find the best fit and the best specialist, sometimes they don't take Medicaid. She's on my insurance now, which is nice, so that's changed, but that was a really big deal. We couldn't find an epileptologist that would take her insurance. Then we finally found one that we couldn't get in for months and months and months. Um, that's a really big deal. When we're inpatient, even at Primary Children's, which we love, there's still lots of barriers. We, Kate is full care, so she can't sit up in the bath. So I have to bring a bath chair because they don't have one for her on the inpatient floor. Um, there's no changing tables inpatient in the shower area. So I had to lots of times lay down blankets or towels on the floor so she could be changed. There's barriers every single day. Places aren't accessible, even in the hospital. It, there's a lot. It's a lot. Closer to home is a big one. I know that Primary has, or Intermountain, has clinics places. It would be really nice to have a clinic in Elko where, I mean, there's a lot of kids like mine or with special needs in Elko. It'd be great if they had a clinic there, even just staffed once a month. I know everyone would appreciate it. I think there needs to be some kind of a parent panel other than, I know that there's some kind of a parent board, but it's really hard to get on there if you're out of town. There should be a parent panel to ask these questions regularly because I know that other moms have been through the same things that I have um, in our hospital. So it would be nice to all come together and try and fix the things that need to be fixed because sometimes I pe think people just don't know. So what you don't know, you can't fix. The Medicaid thing is a big deal. A lot of special needs families are on Medicaid and we come from all over to Salt Lake. So sometimes it's hard to get our state's Medicaid accepted by the doctors that we need it. Especially if you come from private insurance and you're already established with care and then sometimes circumstances change and you're back on Medicaid and then they don't take that. So you have to change all of your care needs <laughs> to fit that. It's, it's hard. Another one is, you know, just taking into account that kids like ours come with a lot of stuff. So my, for example, my kid is, um, she is tube fed and in the hospital, I have to bring her food, but they won't let me store it on the floor where the other parents store their kids food. So I have to bring a cooler and do ice every day. And then I even have to sign a form that says, if the doctors don't see, don't think it's okay for me to be feeding my child what I want to, they'll feed her what they want to. So I think listening to the parents and taking into consideration every kid's special needs 
that's, it's big. You're already stressed when you're inpatient. You're already scared for your child. And then to worry about things like that is, it makes it even harder. Next, I'd like to invite the uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. And, and, and Riley's teasing me, which is also standard for our relationship. So, uh, Dr. Avendet, please come up. Emmy Gardner, please join. Did you have a, yes. Yeah, please, you can sit, you can sit wherever you like. Um, and I'm going to take a little liberties here and kind of, um, I, I've worked closely and personally with Dr. Avendet and Emmy Gardner. And what you will hear from them is exactly who they are. They love this work. It is a calling for them. It resonates within them and in their being. So they are truly two of the best people I need. And I, I can't quite remember, and I'm sorry, Raymond, is, is Dr. Rodriguez here as well? Two Dr. Rodriguez's. Ah. And Dr. Rodriguez Devos. Oh. And Patricia standing in for, for Manny. So Dr. Rodriguez Davalos is doing a liver transplant right now. The work continues. Yeah. So I'm the wife of the other Rodriguez that's not here. <laughs> so I'll be sitting in. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. So in terms of diversity and inclusion, I work with the Hispanic population. Uh, trying to build some bridges in terms of mental health in that population. So specifically, I've been working in Summit County. We opened a Huntsman Mental Health Institute clinic out there, and we're trying to work with the Hispanic populations. We're training residents that are interested and have some Spanish skills in how to really work with this community, and it's going well. Thank you. Cool. Hi, everybody. Um, it is kind of, I guess, yeah, it's okay. It is fun to kind of be back in my old stomping grounds, actually. And I will just do a shout out like Dr. Tani did earlier, too. It's also great to see all of my besties from Mono McDonald House. I had the good privilege of being on the board there for seven years. Was it seven years? Yeah, just, yeah, it was amazing, amazing, amazing work. Um, I now work for, I don't know if the slides will come up, but yeah, I work now for... Um, an organization that is absolutely incredible. I'm sorry. I, I will borrow Carrie's phrase. I work for the best place in the world. Um, Holy Cross Ministries is actually a nonprofit organization that was founded by the Sisters of the Holy Cross, who, when they sold Holy Cross Hospital, didn't want to leave the valley and kind of did a listening tour and decided what in the world can we do and who do we need to help. And so when Tony asked, hey, can I talk about diversity, equity, inclusion? I said, absolutely, because I feel like I'm in this immersion experience from having spent 30 years in healthcare to now realizing that I, and, and again, I say this with all humility and, and grace and space of I love and we worked and we tried so hard at primary to be inclusive and to be supportive and, and we had our language services and things and honest to Pete guys, we didn't know what we didn't know. And part of why I say this immersion experience is that while our mission says that we help the underserved community in the state of Utah, we really have developed this niche with the Latinx community, right? And so I feel like I can kind of speak from that frame of reference. And to me, um, what I've learned is, you can go ahead to the next slide, and that's all I've got, is um, just that it is so important not only to be thinking about bilingual, it is so important to be thinking about bicultural. So what Patricia said is so key and is so important. Because I get that we can have iPads and I get that we can have a language line, but honestly, if we don't have that cultural understanding of the clients that we're serving, and the other piece is like super important. Like I always say, I'm a proud Mex-Italian, right? I'm 50-50, but you know what? I'm from Mexico. I have staff from Chile, from Venezuela, from Peru, from Colombia, and every culture is different, right? And we have to honor and respect that and not just say all Hispanics or all Latinx or all whatever. And so it's been an interesting space to be in to, ha to over this past kind of transition with the previous administration that totally vilified immigrants, right? And they're all rapists and murderers. I am here to tell you, they are the most resilient, hardworking, dedicated individuals I have ever met. And it is my sincere honor and pleasure to serve in a capacity to help the community. But it's, but it's frustrating because through COVID, 
what we saw, and you guys saw that in the data and the stats, right? While you know we had a 50, a 15 percent COVID positivity rate, when you looked at essential workers, the vast majority of those who are the Latinx population, 40 percent COVID positivity, right? So through COVID, what we've learned is about the incredible health disparities and equities that are there, right? And so we have a long way to go. So I would say I am super proud of the years I was at Primary Children's, the amazing work that Primary's done, but I would ask you all, please lean in and try and work harder. We have so much more work to do when it comes to health disparity and when it comes to health inequity. And so I would just take, Riley, I loved your comments. Orly, I loved your comments. And it was, I would just say, okay, let's take all of those experiences you've had and let's amp that up and put it on steroids because now imagine trying to do that Medicaid application, Riley, when you don't speak the language, right? You speak another language and maybe you're not even literate in your native language, right? And I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I'm sure there may be some social worker case managers in this room, right? The reality is, sorry, I'm just gonna say it, DWS is working hard to exclude people, not include people in eligibility, right? So, okay, yeah, thank you, Riley, right? So imagine trying to do that again when this isn't your country, this isn't your culture, this isn't your language, right? So we have got to get better at embracing, supporting, I mean, bringing humanity back to healthcare, right? So I just wanna share a couple of stories and, and the, the points that I put in there, so again, like I said, bilingual, bicultural, huge, huge, huge. Please think about that. Please do your part. We at Holy, I'm super proud, we, we grow our own. We used to say that at primary all the time, right? We'd start with CNAs and then we'd make them ADNs and then we'd make them RNs and they'd go on to NPs. We're doing the same thing at Holy, right? We start with people at the front desk and then they become DOJ accredited reps or then they become um, community health workers or then they, they say, oh my gosh, I wanna go to grad school and become a social worker. And I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. You know, so like we are doing our piece to kind of bring that next generation of first gen culturally competent folks to the profession. We've got to do stuff like that. You know, we just finished the legislative session. We were pushing really hard for this alternative pathway piece so that, you know, we have people in the community that have graduated from colleges with degrees, but because they can't pass, and I'll say this because I'm a social worker, the ASWB exam, which I kid you not, is normed solely for middle class white East Coast America, right? Why should they not be able to practice in their field, right? So we are super excited, you know, because now this gives a pathway for CSWs to actually be in the field, do an apprenticeship, do an internship, and practice. I sit on a mental wellness coalition for Summit County because we do a lot of work up in Summit in the Wasatch back. Rural mental health, huge, right? Summit County alone, we need 40 bilingual, bicultural therapists to meet the mental health needs of one county of Utah alone, 40. So again, when we say health equity issues, it's, it's pervasive in the state of Utah and we need to do better at that, right? The other piece that I would say, and again, um, is, is huge and you see it at the heart of that slide there, is it is all about trust. Just as, you know, as Riley discussed, I mean, any child that's being treated here, I mean, it's, you're dealing with a child who is a part of a family system, right? Um, the piece that I would say is when you're dealing with a child of a family system from another country, and I'm speaking broadly, I mean, granted, our expertise is Latinx, but any other country, right? We have a lot of immigrants and refugees coming. You need to understand what does that child's illness, how, what is that doing to that family's experience, right? And how is their culture, their faith perspective, their spirituality, how is that impacting and affecting that? And the only way you get at that is by building relationships. Yes, Orly, it's all about relationship and it's all about building trust, right? And, and I get that it's about listening, but you also need to understand that especially in the Latinx community, there is a deference to authority figure and there is a, there is a, a kind of a, a, you know, the quiet compliance. Well, yeah, they did do this. They signed the consent form because they smiled and nod. They didn't understand a damn thing you said but they just smiled and nod. That is not informed consent, right? So how do we build that relationship? How do we draw out information? How do we help families sort of um, be fully engaged in that process where their tendency is to say, I'm just gonna defer to what, what the medical professional has to say. So I say now being on the community side of healthcare, but still very actively involved in healthcare, there are agencies, not just ours, there are plenty of agencies out there partner with those community agencies who are those trusted allies with the, with the clients that you're serving, with the patients and families. Um, I'm just gonna share a couple of stories too about 
just to kind of highlight that because it is about building that trusting relationship. To your point, Riley, about the, my God, Medicaid's impossible. You know, we have a whole team of community health workers. A massive amount of their daily work is helping people navigate the Medicaid system. And think about mixed status and undocumented families. So the reality is we have families who maybe mama isn't, isn't documented, but she's now just had a baby, right? So we're gonna help her apply for emergency Medicaid and then get the baby on Medicaid, right? So again, added layers of complexity because of the immigration situation. Another just joyous thing, I say this to probably all the folks who work at primary, you know, we have this cliff coming up right now, um, May 1, the PHE is going away, so that emergency Medicaid that was there for everybody drops, boom, May 1. So our team is scrambling busy now, trying to make sure that people can recertify and stay on, because some of those folks probably think, I have insurance, why is that gonna go away, right? So, I mean, huge issue, we're gonna have people lapsing and then needing to redo. Yeah, and so um, just one quick thing that I'll just share, um, just in terms of telling you the importance. I'm gonna do one simple story, again, for Neil, because he'll appreciate this. We run a Parents as Teachers program. It is a evidence-based, nationally recognized curriculum. We do it with bilingual, bicultural home educators. We had an experience with um, a family, a little two-year-old that they were working with, that was doing all this biting, didn't make any sense. Sent him to the pediatrician, says it's developmentally okay. They're still doing home visits. It's not making sense. They asked the parents for permission to talk to the pediatrician. They show pictures, they finally do lab work. This kid had a lead level of 20, okay? So again, had the family just kind of done their thing, it's developmental, it's fine, it's whatever, but how do we kind of push and advocate the best for kids? So then that, that parents as teachers educator worked with the health department, we went out, assessed, they were, work, they were living in a really old kind of like cabin out in the Wasatch back, right? Lead all along the windowsills, which are perfect height for a toddler, right? So I mean, had we not intervened, had we not kind of gotten into that and helped, and actually that cute little picture of the little boy with a graduation, that's him graduating from our school readiness program. When we went back and kind of reassessed after they were able to work with the health department, here's the complexity. Family was worried to tell the landlord they thought they would get evicted, right? So the stuff that you and I would say, advocate for our kid, it's gonna be fine. This was a mixed status family, they were worried, they're gonna get kicked out, we can't do this, right? So just happy to tell you he's doing well now after he finished, yeah, and no negative impact of that. You know, I could share with you thousands and thousands of stories, but my time is up but happy to answer questions. I am a pediatric hospitalist. Uh, I work at Primary Children's and also at Riverton. I was on last night at Riverton, so if I'm a little uh, discombobulated, that is why. Um, but uh, I also am the medical director of a program called the Connector Service. Um, it is a service through Primary Children's where we work with families with children with medical complexity. Um, so they have to have three body systems or more involved, but also work with these families who have high social needs. So what that means is a lot of times they are are disenfranchised in a lot of ways. So we see these families and work with them and they have political social determinants of health because all social determinants of health are politically determined um, that are affecting their access to care. So I can speak more to the access to care piece, but I feel like access to care and equity go very much hand in hand and are about as overlapped as you can get. Um, and so I, I am able to work with these families with a small team, um, we, we're small but mighty, and we are able to work with these families, go into their homes, learn about their home living situations, um, and actually see the things that are barriers to care. Because a lot of times as providers, we looked at these families and we say, they're not coming. They're not coming to appointments, they don't care, whatever it is, and then you find out there are so many barriers to them being able to come. They're worried about shelter. They're worried about food. They're, they're, they know that their child is ill, but they're very focused on just being able to meet basic needs right now. So how can we help them meet those needs and learn to advocate for themselves, learn how to um, basically empower families to navigate the medical system, which, as Emmy said, is often built to keep families out. Um, unfortunately, that's kind of the way that it works sometimes. Um, and uh, we want to make sure that these families do have someone who's working with them to learn how to be an advocate um, and also working with their pediatricians to be able to kind of hand off to them because we can't stay with them forever. Unfortunately, we would love to because we love our families very, very much on this team. Um, and so being able to work with these families and see how marginalized, how disenfranchised these families are, it's very stark. And um, as a medical system, we can do so much better. 
uh, especially, you know, as a big hospital, primary children's, I, I work here on a regular basis and get to see these families in the hospital. And sometimes I'll make those snap judgments and I'll remember my work on the connector service and I'll say, what are the barriers that this family is facing? And I think the word barriers always comes up in my mind. The biggest example I can think of is a family who they couldn't, they, they weren't following up, they weren't going to appointments, they weren't picking up their prescriptions, all these different things and, and providers were very frustrated with this because the child had pretty significant medical needs and my team was consulted and we took the child on and we do an in-home assessment. We got to the home and we realized the reason they couldn't come is because they lived on the second floor. This child was too big to be carried down the stairs. So they couldn't, mom couldn't get the wheelchair down the stairs. We got them a first floor apartment. Guess who started coming to appointments? Guess who started coming to get pick up all of these things, right? Because we were able to get them transportation and things like that. So by addressing the social political determinants of health, we were able to push forward and actually address their medical issues, right? And so it, that's just a small example of some of the things that we do, but it's also just opened my eyes to a wider world of what we need to be thinking about as medical providers, um, because a lot of times we don't think about the social, we don't think about these things, about the equity piece for our patients. And that's something that we should be thinking about that maybe is more impactful sometimes than the medical care that we provide. And so um, uh, I just shared those examples with you, and that's kind of where, where my focus is on that access to care, but it's very much married in with the, with the equity pieces um, and inclusion pieces for, for my patients. So, hello, my name is Jose Rodriguez. I am a family physician by training, and I served the University of Utah essentially the University of Utah as a whole and University of Utah Health as Associate Vice President for Health Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And so I love hearing these stories because these are on the ground stories on how we are changing outcomes for individual patients. And that's what our work is all about. But my job specifically is a lot further back. I think I have six slides. I only want to do the third slide. So our office does a lot of work at the 30,000 foot level. So if you think about the academic system and the health system, we have diversity officers in the Huntsman Mental Health Institute, in the Huntsman Cancer Institute, diversity officers in the library and in each of the academic units on the health sciences campus. It, additionally, in the School of Medicine, almost every department has a vice chair who is tasked with equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so our job is really, there's four parts of it. Part of it is learner programs. We're trying to help people see our careers, principally medicine, but not only medicine, as a viable option for them. And so we run multiple pathway programs and multiple outreach programs. Another thing we do, I'm looking it up there, is we do research, all right? Health equity is important. People around here and everywhere else don't wanna put money in it if they don't see what it can do. So all of our pathway programs, we've written about it, it's published in the literature, and we continue to do that. A lot of those pathway programs are actually well run and in the Department of Pediatrics, which you'll hear from the chair very soon. Um, and we love this work because it's designed to elevate the work that's getting done on the ground. Because at the end of the day, what's gonna change what happens on the ground is who does the work and how they do the work. Another thing we, do a lot of work on is in policies for the, the health system as well as nationally. So we've published many papers on what needs to happen in individual institutions to change who does the work, to change leadership, so that policy will change naturally. And then the last little bit about this is transparency. So one of the things that I find very frustrating is that there's a whole bunch of work that gets done and not everybody hears about it. And so if there's equity work that's being done in research places around the, uh, around the health system, that goes onto our website. If there's diversity changes and if there's not diversity changes, all that is on our website. And we're not just talking about students or faculty, we are also talking about leadership because we know that leadership needs to change for 
all these other things to happen. I'm very, very happy with the work that gets done here at Primary Children's, the work that gets done in the Department of Pediatrics. I think that this is a national model on how we can do health equity, diversity, inclusion work. And especially now that there is, I will say, um, I guess the word is controversy on what exactly equity, diversity, and inclusion work means. Here in these circles, there's no controversy. We know exactly what it is, and we have people who are committed to doing it. And I want to stop talking now because I want to hear from you guys. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thoughts? Questions? Yes. Okay, so I understand that I am a white woman, very privileged. <laughs> I am young, and I just... Where can I start? How do I support these people? How can we, you know, in this younger generation that's raising these medically complex kids, what can I do from my standpoint to support these families? How can I include them? What, you know, give me like the very, very basics of how do I start to support these people that can't support themselves in most ways? Tell me all the things. I will answer with your own words. Ask. Remember what you were talking about? Yeah. Ask. And and I and I think everybody gets caught up in the translation and you have an iPad and some weird lady asking the questions. That's not optimal. But even in that case, ask. I too am another hat I wear. I'm the parent of a now young adult with special needs, right? The first time anybody asked me how I was doing, I think he was seven. Okay, so ask, and you said it very well. It impacts the entire family. So any illness, mental illness, I can't even tell you. Grandparents even get involved in these situations. So ask, how are you doing? Como estas? As easy as that. Como estas? Learn that word. <laughs> Let learn that word. And I think the cultural piece, born and raised in Mexico, came for training. I've been here 25 years now. I thought I had it all figured out because I came from Mexico. I haven't. The people that are here, it's a whole different beast in terms of culture. Yes, they came from Mexico. Yes, I understand them. I speak their language. But when you come here and you have to adapt, and I think I, reflecting on it, I think I've gone through some of this myself. Like, you're not from Mexico anymore. You're not from here either. And, and who knows what your immigration situation is, which it's a huge layer, right? So I've, I've learned to see these people as a, a new community. And what happens to those kids? I'm, I'm very interested in, in that specific area. They are born and raised here. They're American kids. They don't speak Spanish. And Spanish is spoken at home. Like I've seen so many cases where the kid only speaks English, maybe a few words in Spanish. Parents speak Spanish. Like what, what's happening? So they're different. And we need to learn to understand where they came from, what they're doing here, what their life is every day, and how we can connect with that. So in my work now in, in Park City, I'm learning more about these families. Mom has three jobs. Mom has three jobs. She's not home. And, and, and the kid is there, mental health issues. How can we help them? Let's ask what you were saying. How are you? What, what's going on with you? And, and, and start there, very basic. And, and try to understand who are they, where they came from, and who they are now here. I would just add one little piece. Patricia said it all really well, but it's that piece of build relationship, right? Because when you think about it, there's so much healing work that still needs to happen because as a country, we don't welcome refugees and immigrants as best we could, right? We are not the country we used to be, but to help people feel welcome and accepted for who they are and not those people or that, that immigrant population and just really 
embracing them as humans and, and building that relationship is so affirming. And that's a great place to start. I was just going to say, I love the idea of just asking. I think that's important. The thing I can say as a white woman with a lot of privilege is um, that saviorism is something that is easy to fall into and that we want to, you know, that's very much a tendency of white women. We want to be able to dive in and be like, I'm going to lift these people up and I'm going to do so much for them. And you're like, no, asking them what they actually need. What are their goals? What are their needs? Right? Where, where do you, what, how can we, how can I lift you? How can I augment that and kind of follow from behind? How can I lift up the voices of people who are already doing this work? There are so many people who are already doing the work and they have organizations. They have people out there in the community, like Holy Cross Ministries, like uh, Catholic Community Services, right? You think about all these organizations who are already doing the work. Why do you need to do the, re duplicate the work? Just lift up the voices of people who are doing the work, who understand the marginalization better than you ever will. So that that's what I would say, especially from my perspective as a very privileged white woman sitting here on a panel talking about equity and inclusion. So thank you for talking about privilege. A, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to actually call the person who actually invented the term white privilege. Her name is Peggy McIntosh. Her phone number is actually on the internet. Yeah, and I, I Googled her, and I called her. She was 83 years old. It was seven years ago. Like, she's 90 now. And she answered the phone. And so with her, we actually composed a paper on sharing the power of white privilege. I'm sorry. It's supposed to, sharing the power of white privilege. The big deal here is that privilege is power. And so if we understand, and now all of us here have different kinds of privileges uh, sitting at this panel. So I can't count myself that I don't have privileges. I got, boy, that male privilege, that's something else. I'll talk to you about that later. <laughs> all right? <laughs> but uh, I would lean into the privilege and understand that the privilege is to extend to those who have less. And if you understand that, you won't go wrong. And it's a hard thing to do because it had, it, it's reflection. And I find myself doing that because of my equity work, but also because there's lots of spaces that I don't exist in that I need somebody to talk for me. But those are actually spaces that you could exist in. And by being that ally, we can actually get the message across. So just to add to that, basically all I was going to say is you talk about being white, privileged, whatnot. Just treat these people like they're human, like they're you. Like <laughs> they're just like you. They're just a different color, come from a different background. Treat them human. That's it. That's all I have to say about it. <laughs> um, in my, in just this little bit of space, I've had some people comment both on my tattoos and my belt buckle. There is uh, Spider-Man has a theme, right? <laughs> right with. with with, he got with great power comes great responsibility. And you have great power. So what's your responsibility with it? And I've asked that question of doctors, of nurses, of even kids in the hospital. You have great power. But what's your responsibility here as a patient? What does that look like to you? And hearing them say, I think this is my responsibility. I think this is what I have to do. Or a family. So I love it. Yes, we have a couple questions over here. We'll start in the back. It's not so much a question, sorry. I don't know if everyone can hear me. Um, so I am culturally, I am Mexican-Hawaiian with Native American on my Mexican side, and I married into a Tongan family. So I got all kinds of awesomeness going on. Pray for my kids in the three languages. But um, just what I've noticed um, being married to an immigrant from Tonga is, you know, in the last year, we've had probably four of my husband's friends pass away from things that they shouldn't have passed away from, right? Because of culturally, they're terrified to go to the hospital. Because where they come from in Tonga, if you go to the hospital, you just basically die, you know? So there isn't that extensive amount of health care that we have here. And I can second that because when we went to Tonga, I cut myself on a reef 
And my husband's like, don't go to the hospital. You're just going to get another infection on top of it. Like, don't go. So, you know, we just self-medicated at home. Um, but to speak to that, you know, there's still, I think, a lot of work to be done here within Utah. Um, I think we're tapping into the Latinx community very well. Um, but as these different cultural groups grow, the understanding of where they come from and like, you know, their fears and their boundaries from where the countries are coming from and culturally, I think is a huge leap that we could take, you know, um, because that Polynesian community is growing so much here in Utah at a very surprisingly rate. And I always ask my husband, why here? There's no beach. Why are you guys here? But um, it's for the opportunity. And so, and I'm grateful um, that, you know, I'm in a position where I can help speak on their behalf um, now being in both sides of you know, the stories. And so, yeah, I just wanted to add that. Um, so I also don't have a question, um, but I, we've talked a lot about like working with individuals and like when we're in that setting, but I think oftentimes we forget that we can do a lot, even when we aren't in an opportunity to meet individuals and folks. Um, and like voting is a really big thing. Cause like, I think something that has been identified by the panelists is a lot of times, it's the societal things that are causing these barriers. And so we need to make sure that there's policy change instead of just local change because we can't do as much as we can if we're on more of a grand scale. Um, and there's also a really good book um, about, uh, sorry, racial trauma and white body supremacy um, called My Grandmother's Hands. Um, so that's a really good resource as well. I do have a question. <laughs> Mine is a more boots on the ground question. So I work directly with a lot of these families who are undocumented and non-native English speaking, most of them Latinx. Um, and I love the idea like of these warm fuzzy talks that we have about equity and inclusion in healthcare, but the reality is that they are not wanted in our healthcare system. When they show up and they don't have insurance and they don't speak English, Nobody wants to help these families. And especially, and this is the problem, I, this is where my question comes in. Working in pediatrics, we're a little bit better about those warm fuzzies and helping these families. But I have so many kids who are going to age out of my charitable hospital, and they are not going to get any care unless they go to the emergency room. And these are complex kids with spastic quadriplegic CP, who need wheelchairs, who need physical therapy, who need Botox injections, which are not cheap. I, and I like admittedly feel very helpless when I have a kid who's 19 years old and I'm talking to the family and I'm handing them like the immigration resources, like you have to get him papers. Otherwise no one is going to treat you. So, I guess speaking to the policy question, we need to change policies, but what do I do as a social worker on the ground working with these families? And I'm talking to someone who, they have a seven-year-old and we can treat them till they're 21, but I'm looking at this family like, okay, but you gotta fill out the paperwork because then he has to wait five years. And then he has to wait another 10 years on the DSPD wait list for you to get Medicaid. So, how do I guess how do I get that sense of helping the family understand that it they're living day to day? And I try to explain to them, I'm looking in 10 years, 20 years into the future for your child, and I really want to make sure that he has the care that he needs as an adult and that you have the support that you need as an adult. But what do I do today to help that family? Thanks for your question. Yes, thank you. It's, it's the tough question, but it, that's what I mean by being an ally. That's what I mean by we do a great job at primary, but we've got to do more because you're right. It seems like healthcare we've lost. We ask about insurance before we ask how are you doing, right? We've lost our soul. That's a great way to put it, Jose. We've lost our soul. And I'm here to say it's time to get the soul back, right? So I need to introduce you to two people that are sitting right in front of you that will help. Um, they're from Holy Cross, um, our director of health outreach and one of our community health workers, so Carlos and Carmen. But, but again, you're right. I think part of the issue is, I would say, and again, this isn't like a plug for us, but for any organization, as a social service organization, I, we have the great privilege of also having 
a rather large immigration department, right? I have two attorneys, four DOJs, paralegals, legal assistants, because we know with the Latinx community, immigration is such an issue to that. So what I would say is I'll, I'll get with you after. We can kind of see what we could do in consultations for some of those families. The other thing that I would tell you is we've been doing this thing for years and years. It's actually with the university. Um, it's South Main Clinic now, but when it used to be an FQHC, it's a program called Niños Especiales Familias Fuertes, right? So we are working with, so think about this. You know, again, your experience, Riley, but again, then imagine that if you are an undocumented mom, right, and you're worried you're going to get deported, and your kid's 19 and wheelchair dependent, and what about guardianship, and what to do, and what are you going to, what happens if you get sent back to your home country, right? So, like, I, I just say that, and I don't mean that to, like, sound like hoity-toity, but it's, again, that piece of realizing we need so much to be in allyship because the burdens and the challenges of folks who are just trying to escape horrific situations and make a better lives for themselves is just so great that it's like anything you and I think we would have to challenge, like take that and magnify it times 10. But I tell you, these folks are not wanting handouts. They're not wanting to be in public assistance, like all the kind of, you know, kind of rhetoric was out there for that. They want to make a difference. They want to thrive. They want to contribute to society and community. We just need to change those systemic barriers to allow that to happen so that people can be included and can have opportunity. But definitely, we'll talk after. Yeah, yeah, great question. I just want to speak to the policy piece. Um, I think the policy piece is something that I'm very passionate about. It's something I spent a lot of time on the Hill with the AAP, actually, and just talk with legislators and things like that. Um, and yeah, yeah, like Medicaid for All, like Voices for Utah Children really worked really, really hard for years and years and years with Senator Escamilla on this. And they pushed and they have made some big, big changes, which is great. And so we can push for those things. But I just want to say, like, if you are interested in the policy piece, if you want to make a difference, you're like, well, policy is scary. And it is. It can be really overwhelming because especially in a state like Utah, where we have a one political party that kind of runs the show. That means that organization and working with people who know what they're doing is the most important piece. So I would say find an organization that you trust and you believe in that has a, an advocacy arm and you can be a part of that and make a difference when it comes to actual policy pieces. Because for me, one of the things that, one of the reasons I got involved in advocacy is because I'm angry all the time, like the Hulk, right? I'm <laughs> constantly furious, okay? I, my secret is that I'm furious every single day of the week, every moment. I am constantly angry. And so I have to be able to, because if I keep that inside, that's just not great for me. And so to be able to channel that into something is great. So I was able to find that like policy piece, like, okay, I can channel this into talking with people, trying, you know, playing the politics, which is not fun and comfortable sometimes because you're just like, can you just, can you just give kids what they need? No? Okay, cool. Um, and so it's it, it's very, you just have to be willing to kind of be un, in that uncomfortable space and work with people that you trust who you know have the same similar values. They maybe not exactly the same values, but are pushing for the things that you care about that are making sure that all kids can be covered, that are making sure, it, regardless of their documentation status, that are making sure that maybe that that medically complex children's waiver or DSPD, that list is shorter because I know I'm trying to get kids on DSPD all the time and it's a freaking nightmare, it is terrible. So just thinking about those things, if, if as, you're, as you're working with people who are on the ground who are doing the work, you know, don't feel like you have to do all the work, but then if you wanted to be involved in policy, find those groups, be part of, be part of those groups because there are people who are making big changes. And we do, even in a state like Utah where you feel like maybe it's a little hopeless, there are people who have made big changes, like just that the bill for, for Medicaid for all the kids, you know, that's passed, right? That's huge. Um, and that raised it to the federal poverty level. And so like we, we can be covering more kids. And so there are places where there's movement. And so if you want to be involved in those things, I would recommend finding a group that you trust to work with. Thank you. You know, I, I think about, I, uh, my family is Puerto Rican. And so when I came to Utah, I learned that I wasn't Puerto Rican, but I was actually Mexican, which was fun. And I and I love the and I love the Mexican culture, but you know, it's the Latinx uh, that that community is very diverse. But when we think about it, it's a couple of things we can remember. One is, you want policy change, you got to change the policymakers. 
And then the other thing is we can't give hospitals and health systems a pass on this. There is really not a reason why we couldn't sell insurance to people who aren't documented. People, they'll pay for it, okay? And so we could go to our leaders here at Intermountain and our leaders at the U and say, we have health plans. Let's figure out a way to get people insured. Because you know how it is. This is a hard working, dedicated population that will pay, and a lot of them will pay a lot more than they can afford just to get the insurance. So let's not give them a pass. I also think that the hospitals could give a huge discount to that population, but that's a different issue. I just think, going off of what Aaron said, there has been so much change in the Utah legislature right now with people that are willing to listen to the special needs community. You know, Marsha Judkins, for example, um, you know, Escamilla, it's just, there's, there's so many representatives right now that are looking for these issues, that want to hear these stories, that want our families in front of their committees so that we can start changing things. And I think that's the best thing to do right now is to, to connect with these, these you know, message these people and email these people and say, I'm your constituent. This is what I want to talk to you about. I have a family that's willing to talk to you. How do I get them in front of you? And they'll tell you. They will tell you. I think, like you said, the Medicaid passing was massive. The funding for DSPD and the funding for the medically complex children's waiver, the caregiver compensation that just passed, nobody in a million years thought that that was going to go through. But these people are starting to warm up and open up to the medically complex families, and we need to get these groups in front of them. And I think, you know, as a social worker, you have the opportunity to start planting that idea in their head. Social workers are the best. I freaking love social workers. But you have the opportunity to start saying, have you have you thought of telling your story? Have you thought of getting this kid in front of Representative Judkins, in front of Representative so-and-so? And they're going to be terrified at first. We all know it. I'm terrified. I don't, I, like, I still get, like, that throw up feeling, you know? But, like, these people are so willing, and now I think you have the perfect opportunity to start warming up this community and saying, it's going to be terrifying. It's going to be scary. I don't know what's going to happen, but they need to hear it from you. And I think that's the biggest thing right now with the, the political shift that's happening in Utah that, that could be done. I don't know. What do I know? <laughs> yes, we have a question in the back. Yeah, so I think that's a great, that's a great point is as social, social workers um, empowering our patients to be a part of the change process themselves. Um, but I just wanted to make a comment. So I'm a social worker here at Primaries, and I work um, with transplant. Um, and I don't know if this is like a thing, but we have had transplant patients that haven't been eligible for transplant um, because of insurance issues. We have had them um, sign up for like commercial insurance, not through the marketplace, but directly through commercial providers during open enrollment, even if they're not documented. So I didn't know, um, I don't know if you know that that's a possibility, but we did reach out like through Select Health and things like that. And they have been completely able and willing to pay for it and it hasn't been an issue. So I just wanted to point that out. Can you hand the uh, microphone forward to Young lady, please, thank you. I just have a comment. At Safe and Healthy Families, something that we run into sometimes is that people won't report their sexual assault for fear of being deported. And so the Violence Against Women's Act protects patients from being deported, but I think there's such a distrust with law enforcement and the fact that the victim is actually treated like the problem instead of the victim, and so that's something that we run into a lot. So I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say that for all the people that we represent. You're absolutely right, and there was again through this legislative session two million dollars that the governor signed off on again for DV sexual assault, human trafficking kind of work, which again is huge. Uh, I'm here to tell you, eighty our last highlights document, eighty four percent of the clients that we serve at Holy Cross are survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, right? And there is, for those folks, we need, to, we need folks to be able to know there is a visa status that allows them so they don't have to be afraid of that deportation fear, but a lot of times the perpetrators kind of pull that over their head, right? You report, you don't stay with me, you don't let me keep letting you, be, you know, beat you up kind of thing, I'm gonna report you, you'll be deported. 
we have had an amazing success rate. The challenge right now, though, is that, yes, they can apply for a U visa, but USCIS, which is the national organization that's working on those now, is now only approving cases that were applied for back in 2016. So, I mean, we're talking where it normally was like, you know, maybe an eight month to a, to a year wait. I mean, we're talking six, seven years now, right? But it is a pathway to citizenship for folks if they need. Another thing is that we also work with crime victims reparations. And so the state of Utah believes if you're the victim of a crime, you shouldn't incur any expenses because you are a victim. So if we can just get those people to us because there's trust built within our community, we can get them the resources they need covered by the state. It's just like this barrier because I think there's such a distrust with law, enfor our law, enfor law enforcement partners. Uh, we're, we're about to be, but I'd like to give Janae uh, another comment here. I just actually have an actual question. Um, thinking front lines, we use a lot, we speak to best practices, right? Like how do we train our caregivers to support these best practices? Um, something that a team I'm on, we're tasked with right now is adding a equity lens to bundles, right? Nursing bundles, patient experience bundles. How do we truly impact that? Um, I guess my question is two pieces. One, how do we make those things actionable and equitable across all d different demographics um, or ideas behind that? And the second part of that is anybody willing to have that discussion offline as well as um, I work for the system to to help create some of these things that are actually actionable besides language interpretation. Well, thanks for that. I think that this is partially what our job and our office is tasked with doing is making sure that the equity work gets done at every level. You know, we, we talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion being everyone's job. And that's one of the ways to do it is to put it as part of these bundles. And, you know, we have all these quality metrics that people have for uh, clinical outcomes, you can make an outcome that actually says if they're using the lens or not. It's not easy, but there's metrics that are actually published by the Association of American Medical Colleges. And there's also competencies that are pu published by the same group that we can actually use and operationalize for this exact thing. And I'd love to take this one offline. Thank you. Yes. Uh, difficult, complex, and hope, right? And we didn't even get into the topics of sexual identity and inclusion and all that's happening that way too.